Hi, everyone. I'm Gold Derby News and Features Editor Ray Richmond, and I'm welcoming Trevor Smith from the fifth installment of the FX anthology series Fargo to our TV production designers Meet the Experts panel. Trevor, uh, in many ways, your work designing the production on this 10 installment Fargo was a case of going home again, wasn't it? You were you were there as an art director on the first season in 2014 that starred Billy Bob Thornton and Martin Freeman. Uh, what In what ways would you say that your marching orders this time different from the ones you got a decade ago? Yeah, it was it was a case, uh, Ray, of sort of coming full circle for me. I had done the first installment of the series, which was very much a direct echo of the Coen Brothers' original movie, a lot more referential and, you know, like I said, a bit of a thematic echo chamber of things we saw there. And funny enough, in... Um, year five, which is the, the series I just uh, designed, uh, we also sort of revisit where we came from and sort of tighten up the Fargo circle to um, revisit themes directly from uh, the Coen Brothers film again and um, topographies and locales that are referenced um, directly in the movie as well. So there's almost a back to ground zero um, revisit for us uh, as a Fargo family and of course thematically as a series as well. So it was really cool for me to kind of close the loop personally and professionally get back in step with Noah and build a series that speaks back to what I are directed and also continues to refer to and uh, reverentially look at the Coen brothers um, initial idea. Yeah, it really was so cool. You know, it, it, this installment really is uh, an homage to the original 1996 film you know, that won Oscars for Francis McDormand for the writing. How much did that film influence your build of an entire house for season five? The movie, um, the original movie Fargo was a direct uh, blueprint, uh, literally and thematically for us on the show. Um, we you know, screen capped every scene in the movie, rebuilt the house from uh, footage and um, used that as our baseline to then build up from the needs of season five, which were a lot. So it was a heck of a project and the first one we did out of the gate from a design standpoint to make sure that we, again, had these memories of the movie and the story itself has some wonderful sort of um, direct references to it. You know, the sliding doors, the break in, mm -hmm. the stairs, the shower curtain, all sorts of wonderful and obvious sort of, um, I keep using the word echo, but it fits echoes of the movie. But then the story itself, especially the first four episodes, has so much muscularity and action and so many needs, including, you know, plot spoiler fire and all sorts of things that we had to take that original 1996 idea of a house, the Lundegaards in that case, and in this, in our case, the lions, and then import all the physical needs, three stories of action and violence and uh, suspense. So um, it was a heck of an undertaking to get the house right. And we built it, the interiors in studio, and then built uh, the shell of the house on a location on a vacant lot, believe it or not, on a perfect street and um, matched as much as we could the insides and outsides of both those places. I was going to say, God, uh, oh, Trevor, just an, so much work to replicate the design, not just of the home, but all the artifacts inside it and everything else. Um, was uh, Calgary, where you filmed, kind of an effective stand-in for, for Minnesota and North Dakota? It was. We primarily base camped out of Calgary, Alberta, which is where I'm from and where we've shot four of the five seasons of Fargo. Um, so our mandate was to, you know, we love a rule set, uh, Noah Hawley and myself. So we like rules when it comes to the places and the cities in this particular series. So it was creating rules about, you know, what does Scandia, Minnesota look like? What's our North Dakotan story? And, you know, how do we how do we showcase wealth, shifts in wealth and economy, too? So we had, you know, it's a, it's a combination of color and topography, uh, tree types, and um, put all those things together into the mixer. So for what it's worth, the Lion House in Calgary, it was right downtown near the river. We built in this sort of beautiful heritage arts and crafts street that had really big elm trees that went over because Halloween was such a big theme that I really wanted to get a lot of atmosphere and to make this house feel old and part of a neighborhood and um, upper middle class. And so, believe it or not, we we scouted like crazy and found a lot that was sort of frozen in, in development on the perfect street with the right vibe that gave us those spooky Halloween shadows. 
and leased the property from the homeowners and put our house in there with giant cottonwoods around it and everything. And then um, it, you know, designed the exterior to feel a part of um, that street. So it didn't look out of place. So it had that really wonderful nestled quality that we all aspire to. Seemingly kind of a significant Western design vibe running throughout this whole production, which I imagine was intentional. It was. And, you know, it's really my sweet spot as a designer and as a, as a cinephile too. Um, the North Dakotan side of the equation, uh, Roy Tillman, you know, played by John Hamm, that side, our villainy side of the story, if you will, across the border um, was very much in that Western frontier justice, alt-right sort of uh, chamber of ideas. And we really got to put our cowboy on more than probably ever in the show. So uh, we had a lot of fun with that. And that, uh, again, meaning is differential. And between those two worlds, we could quite easily with color schemes, uh, design patterns, and topography, always make sure the audience knew instantly where they were, uh, scene by scene. So you had a Minnesota feel, you had a North Dakotan feel, and sometimes you had nuances of that, depending where you were on the highway. But we had, as I suggested, uh, a really strong rule set so that we could follow that, and the audience always implicitly knew, even if it was hopefully mostly invisible, where they were, and uh, the associated themes and attitudes with those spaces. Yeah, uh, you know, absolutely. There's a familiarity to it, but really unsettling and kind of peculiar and off kilter beats in each of the spaces you designed too. The cones would have been proud of the things you came up with. It almost looked like they could have directed this thing. <laughs> did it would, feel that way to you too? I mean, that you were did. sort of it would that you were almost you you were almost calling them calling you know getting into their heads while you were working on this. Yeah, I think referencing and paying homage to the Coens is inevitable when you're working on a series called Fargo, but I think we embrace it. You know, we, we understand the pastiche of it and why not lean on good bones when you can. And Noah Hawley and the writing team and myself, we love a good Easter egg. So we put lots of them in and reinterpreted old uh, nuances and little set deck details and props from the whole Cohen filmography um, so it's like this fun sort of second viewing game for fans of the Coen brothers to go back through it, like the tracking device, you know, that uh, Gator uses to track um, Munch is, you know, almost directly from No Country for Old Men and so on and so forth. So there's just a million little teasers in there for those that want to look for them. And it's fun, actually. I think, yes, we're always making a fresh story and Fargo 5 is completely an isolated, standalone, amazing thing. But Nonetheless, you've got the history and you've got the ligature of all these other things. So you may as well use them and have fun with them. Easter eggs, absolutely fantastic. Did, did, did they tell you to put Easter eggs in? Was that, was, was that part of your marching orders? Yeah, it was. I mean, it, maybe not an order as much as encouragement towards the playful, eccentric side of it. So um, Noah and myself as well, we really made a decision early on in this particular installment to um, work in peculiarity and whatever elements we did put in. Um, yes, they're realistic. Or I might argue hyper-realistic to a certain extent, but when we, what we did decorate with to do it strategically and not overdo it. And so there's a sparseness and a simplicity to it. So then we do, when we do drizzle in fun cues and strange paintings in the background, um, they're there with intention and a bit of a tongue firmly planted in cheek sometimes. And I think Noah loves the idea that this universe collides, that there could be something that references you know, season two, um, you know, with alien spacecrafts in one of the paintings, if you look carefully, uh, that kind of looks like a waffle and so on and so forth. So there's this universe, this of, of Cohen and Noah Hawley that pings around no matter what in each of the, each of the uh, expressions. Besides that that original film, uh, Trevor, it looked, your cinematic influences on this looked like it could have been what John Carpenter's Halloween, The Nightmare Before Christmas. You're throwing a lot of a lot of stuff in there. We are, yes, and I think we both realize more than we even thought. There's of course direct reference to the Tim Burton picture, and um, it's set around Halloween, a transitional time where we start to go from fallen leaves to snow. And uh, that spooky home invasion factor is there. And yes, the reason, one of the many reasons I chose the street I did for the lion house and the house design that I did 
was that I did want to reference John Carpenter's Halloween, which I might argue is sort of the baseline for all horror tropes we've experienced since. Um, and that was there with these big elm trees and the relationship and of the house neighbor to neighbor and across the street views. And I think we knew in our heart of hearts that there was something suspenseful, especially about the first four episodes. They're almost like their own uh, mini narrative. But the more we got into it, shooting it with all the violence and the cat and mouse games in that house, um, we realized that, and the darkness, the darkness of the colors we use, the cinematography, that we were making a horror movie. Um, and it really does have so many feelings of horror in it um, from Dot's perspective, from the invaders and vice versa. There's a there's a real dense suspense and um, fear quality to it all. Um, Absolutely, which I love. Um, you infuse so much into this. I think we're going to uh, wrap things there. Season five of Fargo is available to stream in its entire, entirety on uh, Hulu. Uh, Trevor Smith, good luck to you this Emmy season, and thanks for joining us at Gold Derby. It's my pleasure. Thanks for having me. Hi, everyone. I'm Gold Derby News and Features Editor Ray Richmond, and I'm welcoming Alex DiGiolando from the FX psychological mystery thriller A Murder at the End of the World to our production designers Meet the Experts panel. Uh, Alex, I understand the producers of this series scattered the entire world for circular boutique luxury hotels and remote locations to match the isolated Arctic compound storyline and came up empty. So they called you up to ask you to build one from scratch in Iceland. How daunting a task was that? Well, we actually built it in New Jersey. Oh, okay. I stand corrected. Um, in Jersey City. Uh, yeah, I mean, you know, when you read on the page, a big circular hotel and... Uh, you, you you think about all the things that have to happen in it and, you know, it, it probably doesn't exist in the real world. And of course, you do a little bit of research and poking around to see if there's something like that, even things that might not check all the boxes like there is a there is a billionaire's hotel in the in northern Iceland that we actually you we didn't actually shoot the the hotel itself, but we use the the valley that it's in as the as the place where our hotel uh lives um you know but and we looked at that place and we quickly realized that as cool as it was it just didn't check all the boxes that we needed so anyway yes it, be, it became quickly apparent that we had to make this thing from scratch um and uh we were looking for things to um ground it in reality because you know making building the interior is one thing but having something that you need to see from the inside and out <laughs> that doesn't exist becomes a little bit more challenging. So we ended up using a tiny bit of the exterior of that hotel, and um, it, which is in the north of Iceland, and a uh, and the front and back of a, of a geothermal pool house in Eastern Iceland, and kind of stitched those together with some computer graphics and some built elements, and, and we ended up with our hotel. I was hearing that people love the choices you made and the details you crafted so much that they'd have wanted to actually stay in this place. Have you ever considered getting into the hospitality business? I'm designing a restaurant right now for uh, this Netflix show I'm doing. Um, I hadn't thought about it, but it, it's pretty fun. It's, it's you know, I, I studied film theory. So I came into this from a, from a film angle, not so much a design angle, but uh, it, you know, it, 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 you exercise a different muscle doing, doing that kind of design. And, um, um, it's, it's been pretty rewarding. It has looked so sleek and modern and cool. I wanted to stay there too, but you couldn't build every room in this pretend hotel. Uh, right. Yet it's, it yeah. still had to look like a retreat that would satisfy a reclusive, super wealthy tech billionaire and the elite of the yeah. elite. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, we we couldn't even fit the whole circle on our stage, which was not a small stage. It was about twenty six thousand square feet. But we built a semicircle um, and uh, built it as a stacked set. So the 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 pool house I was describing for, which is Bach Baths in Iceland, uh, there's kind of a ramp that leads down to the pool house. So we used that as our exterior entrance walkway, um, and then we built the lobby of our hotel. 
as if it were there, you know, at, at the entrance kind of below ground and then the rest of the ring rested above it. Um, and then when, so the right at the top of the stairs from the lobby was our library. And when it was time to, um, so we shot out all that stuff and then we took some time off, went off the stage and ripped out the staircase, plugged up that hole, turned the library into uh, the dining room and shot. So we, we basically had to split up all the work. So we shot half the show, um, but not, you know, all, all at the beginning and then put a pause. So some scenes we shot half months apart. Um, I love the touch of having the Louise Bourgeois watercolor and print artwork in the rooms and hallways. Was that your idea? Uh, Zal and Britt will be very happy to hear that you feel that way. Um, so, so they had put Louise Bourgeois artwork on the cover of the scripts. It's just the, the color palette was inspiring to them. And um, of course, we all love her work. Uh, and then as we were getting, at one point in the design process, we kind of had this concept that there would be no art in the hotel, that the kind of the minimalist, you know, the, the lines were the art. Um, then was, you know, th then Zal was like, I wonder if we could get Louise Bourgeois. And so we reached out to the estate and worked out a deal to, to reproduce some of her pieces. and. Really beautiful, the way the way the way it just accents everything. Uh, wasn't it a challenge though, also, um, Alex, uh, having to make sure shooting could easily be done in this space? Well, I mean, while you're constructing, you have to also simultaneously be thinking about making sure it's all easily accessible, right? Yeah, um, building in the proper egress and shooting platforms. Um, you know the. You mentioned before we couldn't build every room. We actually didn't build that many rooms of the hotel. So um, we built Darby's room, which then got redressed and doubled as Sean's room. We built the sick bay and then we built Bill's room on the lower level. And all the other rooms are implied. So behind all of those doors are, um, you know, just support space for the crew, um, which they filled up quickly. Although many of them um, would creep into the set themselves because it was far more comfortable uh, to be on those like luxurious couches than uh, on a plywood platform. Were, were you given, given an unlimited budget to construct this and then you did you exceed it, as they say? <laughs> no, I think we, uh, uh, we, I think we stayed pretty true to our budget. I mean, barring the, I mean, we were throwing a lot of curveballs. Um, we started the shoot in Iceland um, to do the exterior work and uh, about two days into filming, almost the entire crew came down with COVID. And oh God. so everyone kind of got sequestered in their um, uh, hotel rooms. I miraculously had come back to the States to work on the big build and was going to go back to shoot the courtyard, which we had built in Iceland, but um, because Iceland has a amazing crew, but limited pool, um, th there were like two other movies on the heels of us that were coming. So, and all the equipment was promised to those. So things that we planned to shoot in Iceland actually ended up having to come to the States. So that whole court circular courtyard where the bonfire happens, which was built um, outside of Reykjavik, that got packed up and shipped to New Jersey and we reassembled it here. Um, I mean, we even had to, the, the, the pool that was part of Deplar farm, the hotel in the North of Iceland where Darby gets trapped in it. We had to recreate that here. And even part of the Canyon, um, we ended up building here. One thing I, I love, and this is really to your cre great credit, Alex, is that you didn't think super high quality and then guilt everything with gold. It's not the kind of look that we peasants might think would suit a billionaire much more lustrous and sophisticated than that, but you didn't need need to attach gold to everything. That, I'm, that had to be your design choice, I'm sure. Yeah, I mean, well, Britt and Zal and I, you know, we've been working together for a long time and we share similar sensibilities, but um, we, yeah, we, since, since the very first thing we did together, the thing that we all kind of marvel at is that that wealth, what like, 
what people think of, of as wealth is actually very uncreative. And often the people who have the most unlimited resources, at least at a certain period in time, this is maybe not happening as much as more, anymore, but re really could think of amazing ways to spend their money that, that you and I can't. And, you know, building um, uh, a large, you know, a, a, a large fortress out of old growth trees in a country that doesn't really have old growth trees seemed like um, a good kind of uh, symbol uh, for for the kind of um, hypocrisy of of Andy. Um, and uh, yeah, um, uh, you know, we looked at Japanese design, we looked at Scandinavian design, we looked at uh, the whole concept of wabi-sabi. Uh, Did you have to search the world for everything for all of your pieces? Yeah, there there were a lot. Um, Lydia Marks is a, a set decorator I work with. We've worked together on many projects, and she did an amazing job sourcing beautiful, you know, pieces from all over. And and also because we were building Iceland and New Jersey, we had to figure out you know things that were. Um, unique to Iceland that we could import here and and build that in. But then also the idea was that Andy would have spared no expense of bringing whatever he, you know, whatever his heart desired. Um, so in some of those things we built, like that grand fireplace uh, in his underground chamber um, and, you know, other things we found. Well, I, th I think we're going to wrap things there. Uh, A Murder at the End of the World is available to stream on Hulu. Alex DiGiolando, good luck to you this Emmy season, and thanks for joining us at Gold Derby. Thanks so much. Hi, everyone. I'm Gold Derby News and Features Editor Ray Richmond, and I'm welcoming Helen Jarvis from the brand new 10-part FX adaptation of the epic 1975 James Clavell novel Shogun to our TV production designers Meet the Experts panel. Helen, did I read that when you were brought in to work on this series, you had never been to Japan, never read the Clavel novel, and never worked on a as a production designer uh, on a limited series before? Well, yes, all of the above is true. Uh, it's a bit unfortunate because I did say all those things, but I don't think I said them in one sentence. <laughs> so every wow. Time, every time I That's one heck of a sales pitch. I do. <laughs> I mean, I thought it made me very wary about being quoted directly. Anyway, that is true. I, 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 I avoided the book in 1975 because it was far too thick and I would probably never get through it and uh, I know everybody around me read the book and uh yeah I'd not worked on a series before and so that was a very interesting proposal you know to do 10 and 10 episodes I'd worked on a number of uh, feature films so it's a slightly different dynamic there and uh and, and for one thing the, the idea that you you have several different directors to work with was quite new to me and uh, no, I've never been to Japan. I um, I plan to go. I, I'm I'm off to Nepal shortly, but I I think next time round I'll, I'll hit Japan. I'd love to go there. Really would. I I'm in I'm in in awe of you here, Helen, because you were able to pull this off and do this unbelievably sumptuous design of a show, despite all of the above. <laughs> so uh, I'm not busting you on this. I'm basically uh, in awe of your skill, in spite of it. Uh, you also didn't have the luxury of working on this in Japan, right? But primarily in Vancouver, British Columbia. Yes. Where yes. it was shot. Just a small bit in Japan, correct? Uh, no, none of it was shot in Japan. Oh, really? Not at all? Yeah, no, there was a plan originally. When I signed on, you know, there was a plan afoot to do six weeks or something like that in Japan. And that that um, very quickly faded. I mean, we were still in the throes of COVID lockdowns. Uh, this was very, very early 2021. And uh, as I understood it, things really shut down in Japan. And so that make it, made it really awkward, you know, to be able to bring crews over there and to have actors. So a lot of our actors who came from Japan were kind of came to Vancouver and had to stay for a year because they couldn't really go back and forth. So all of that complicated. Everybody seemed very fl far flung when we started the show, which was kind of, you know, I, I got used to it. At that point, I, I was so used to working from home, you know, with a crew of people that you zoom with twice a day and uh so it wasn't too difficult to get started but um it would it would have been nice to have had a bit more sort of round the table 
type of dynamic. Right. I, would have, I would have enjoyed that. Um, how, how do you even begin to recreate a look 400 years in the past? I mean, had you ever worked on anything similar, similarly historic, Helen? Or, and I mean, where do you find the confidence that you could pull this off so spectacularly? Well, I think for me, it was really, uh, it was like tackling a, a, a sort of cu a cultural, a new culture. I never had no experience of, you know, there wasn't a single piece of crown molding or, you know, <laughs> dado trim, nothing that you could ever recognize. And I think that was like this sort of fresh slate feel to the show, which the story was so good. And once you start the research of the sort of the principles of the architecture, is very engaging you know you really um you, you come to appreciate the sort of the beauty of nature because so many of your interiors are, are reliant on having beautiful exteriors or, or all of the sets have to open onto gardens onto vistas so that was all very uh, very pleasing you know to be uh, even though we were you know 50 percent or more in the studio um, there was just a lovely sort of open air feel to everything, which um, I think comes across, you know, when we, we embrace the rain in Vancouver. So there's a lot of, a lot of very moist uh, atmospheric vistas, which was kind of, I think, really, really augmented what we, what we did in terms of. It actually just like accidentally really, really yeah. suited everything. Oh, I know. We saw all the seasons and uh, it, it, there's a certain kind of cool, blue gray moisture to a lot of the, the exterior set, the scenes um, that just there was it just sort of helped support the story I felt. What were the the primary challenges in designing a, you, you, a fishing village, a harbor, royal palaces, samurai houses and these sets were many kilometers apart right? They were yes they were uh, we got very lucky we had a couple of really good location choices uh, open to us uh, the fishing village you mentioned first that is a, a, a private property, um, some, I'm not sure, 30, 40 kilometers north of Vancouver. Beautiful bay, lovely little, tiny little bay with a kind of a spit with some a couple of beautiful looking trees that look very Japanese in style. And uh, once, we, once we locked down that as our fishing village location, um, it, it soon followed suit with a couple of other uh, backlot locations. And uh, so I kind of had a couple of teams working, you know, so you, there were these sort of rural uh, buildings being worked on by a certain group of, of art directors. And then we, we got heavily into the, the Osaka Palace sets on stage. So it was like a, several, several themes going at once. And um, it had a really great crew, really great crew. So many logistics. Uh... I would imagine that's a big part of the challenge is just logistically keeping track of everyone and and, yes. and overseeing everything uh, and yeah. being being ten places at once. I think you know having having worked as a supervising art director primarily in my career, I I've always viewed that as as pro, you know project management on on a large scale. So I found myself you know as tackling ten episodes, I, I was very early on i was mapping out what the you know what what, what a, a certain set would look like eight eight episodes from now just because i have i think i've developed a kind of an antenna for developing and keeping keeping all these plates spinning in the air at once and i think that comes from being an art director for many years and i um, that helped that helped me immensely you know i'm not i'm not terribly linear thinker i do five things at once so uh, all of that was 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 helpful i thought how closely did you uh, work with your costume designer, uh, Carlos Rosario, too? Did, Pretty close. Was that, was, was that a big part of it? It was a big part of it, yes and no. I mean, I, I, I had to walk through the wardrobe department 10 times a day uh, in order to get down to the stages. So I was keenly, I was always looking in on the costumes. And he and I spent some time at the beginning. I, I Not having worked with him before, I thought, well, okay, I should develop some themes here, you know, some sort of color we, we need to get together and get the colors right. And that process was really simple. As soon as he, as soon as we kind of mesh what I, I was doing with what he was doing, it just seemed to all flow together nicely. And, um, and we were, I think we were very sort of mutually supportive. And uh, I, I do think that the, I, I still really believe that, that, you know, a good portion of what you're looking at is 
the gorgeous costumes with a bit of background. <laughs> and uh, I felt I, I had to keep, keep things fairly neutral, or what I would call neutral, in order for the costumes and the, the beautiful fabrics to really sing. So I do think that we, we collaborated quite well there. That's awfully humble of you to, to <laughs> want you to to want your your designs to blend in, so you're not you're not stomping all over the the costumes. Um, I you know uh, that speaks very well. I guess maybe that's an art director's perspective too. That you you I think so. you, yeah. you don't want to you don't want to stand out too much, or or maybe no. that doesn't speak well of the designs. You want to blend. Um, uh, yeah. What 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 was your biggest design challenge, would you say, uh, in creating the whole Shogun world here, Helen? Uh, I don't, I can't think it was any one set in particular. It was, it was a sort of, you know, again, not having access to all the directors at once and trying to build have the building blocks of the sets and trying to work out several steps ahead of, you know, how, how can I morph this, like the, the 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 ceremonial meeting hall, the very large set with the gold tigers and so on. I thought, well, I've, at first I thought, well, I'll put the no theater in there. And then later on, I'll put a ceiling on it and I'll take all the tatami out and I'll change all the walls. It'll become the, the palace at Edo, you know. So it was all of that kind of reckoning, I think, all the getting all the building blocks to work and make sure it all fits. And it, and then the certain sort of unknown aspect was as you meet each new director and they have their opinions and how you know you try to introduce them to my my basic plan, but but obviously be uh, completely open to their suggestions as well. So very different than working on a feature film. So it's I don't think I've got any one particular set that was a you know any more challenging than another. To be honest. It was well, more the more the process that was the challenge, I think. Thank you for that. Well, I think we're gonna we're gonna wrap things there. Uh, Shogun is available to stream on Hulu. Helen Jarvis, good luck to you this Emmy season, and thanks for joining us at Gold Derby. Thank you very much. Hi everyone, I'm Gold Derby News and Features Editor Ray Richmond, and I'm welcoming James Merrifield from the eight-part Hulu historical drama "We Were the Lucky Ones." to our TV production designers Meet the Experts panel. The project depicts the Holocaust from the perspective of a single family of Polish Jews before, during, and after the war, and based on Georgia Hunter's best-selling 2017 novel. James, uh, one Have thing it. that's imme immediately uh, apparent from watching the series is how bold the color palette is and how vivid the detail. Yet at the same time, it avoids a lot of the kind of visual World War II cliches we've all grown accustomed to, you know, the washed out look, the sepia tones. I'm guessing that aspect appealed to you. Yes, indeed. It was a choice we made very early on that we didn't want to do a sort of brown Holocaust movie uh, or a series in this case. Um, we, 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 we definitely, we, we it, we plummeted for um, washed out color uh, as though, because, you know, bearing in mind that, I mean, the, the these, um, uh, the ghettos, uh, for instance, that we that we obviously built uh, several of, um, uh, they, they were once upon a time happy places, you know, full of color, full of life, full of optimism and hope. Uh, so what we wanted to do is maintain that so that these these characters uh, really sit uh, within the space, but at the same time. Uh, you know, they, they feel like they belong because their hearts and souls belong in these spaces. And yet, you know, their, their hearts, their souls are being ripped out of them uh, by the, the uh, devastating circumstances that they inflicted upon them. I love the idea in this series that every, everything is in full rich color from the art direction to the props, to the cinematography, to the costumes, to the production design. How did that inspire you? I mean, personally, as a designer in your in the spaces you create. Well, I mean, you know, it, it's always a joy to meet a team of people that that uh, you know uh, together bring uh, extraordinary teamwork to the table. And I felt that from the very beginning, we all arrived with the right um, uh, mentality, the the right uh, you know feeling uh, uh, from from the soul too. So you know uh, that the, every HOD, I would say, uh, f 
you know, became a, a, a fantastic um, counterbalance of each other. Um, and, you know, obviously we were led by uh, an extraordinary director, uh, Tommy Kale, uh, who, and then uh, obviously two other directors, Amit Gupta, Nyasa Hardiman, all three of which brought their deepest passion to the project as well. And obviously, as you've, as you've already said, it's a huge story to tell uh, about this extraordinary family that, that somehow, against all the odds, managed to survive um, and are reunited at the end. So, you know, and also our story, although primarily shot in Romania, in uh, Bucharest, uh, which is where we built most of our sets uh, and, uh, and sourced many of our locations, we also use Spain. We were in Spain to to give us uh, Dakar, Casablanca, Rio, uh, Palestine, um, and Italy, even. So you know, it was it was a it was a very large spectrum of color and textures that we that we were to inhabit and hopefully bring to the screen. <clears throat> yeah, you. This was a nine month shoot, wasn't it? Quite a quite a long one. Uh, yes, it was a long, <laughs> it was a long haul. Uh, we were in it for the long haul, but uh, you know, we we uh, yeah. I mean, I last count, I think. Uh, well, I lost count when we got to two, the two hundred and thirtieth set. Uh, it became like okay, yeah, another set, yeah, 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 another set. So we, I mean, but I was led uh, or, or 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 supported by and led sometimes by the most extraordinary crews. I mean, the, the crew in Romania are some of the best people. In fact, the current project I'm working on right now, I'm still using the storyboard, I'm still using the concept artist, I'm still using an art director, albeit remotely from Romania. Uh, extraordinary um, people and, uh, you know, how they turn sets around and built them in the time that we did against all odds with that we were building, for instance, we built our Radon ghetto uh, in the through the winter, you know, a Romanian freezing cold winter. And um, you were asking earlier about what one of our our other um, uh, friends on on these uh, calls uh, saying what was our greatest challenge. One of our greatest challenges was the fact that the paint was freezing in the spray guns. Uh, so you know, these poor guys were up, uh, you know, cherry pickers trying to spray the set. But it was just frozen, so they had to uh, boil kettles and get, use hot paint uh, to <laughs> to enable us to paint the set. So uh, yeah, it was it was it was um, you know quite an, quite an ordeal, but uh, always a challenge and and obviously an exciting challenge. You don't think of you don't think of the weather impacting you as a designer uh, or with any of the. Did, did, I, I'm still I'm still re reeling from. Did you say 230 sets? Yeah, that that was the last count. <laughs> yes, yes, two hundred and thirty. I'd say also about mm, more probably sixty percent of that was on a say was on stages uh, or backlog. Um, when I say stages, primarily warehouses, big, you know, cold, freezing, you know, warehouses uh, that we stacked with, you know, stacked with sets from the Alcina ship to the Kirk's apartment, which is obviously plays heavily in episode one uh, before the war and then into the war. Uh, and, um, you know, uh, uh, sewing factories and prisons. And, you know, we, we, we yeah, we, we, we had a lot to, a lot to chew the fat on, put it that way. When people wonder why did these projects, why are they so expensive? You know, it's sort of like, well, you know, you, you, there's so many details that people don't think about when they just watch something, you know, that somebody yes. like you behind the scenes is responsible for, for so much of the look and the texture. Um, what were some of the details you added to the sets, uh, James, that uh, to make the story feel like it could be happening today? Because I think it sounds well, you, like you, those were your marching orders. Yes, we. I mean, you, you touched on something there that it, it's how do you do it for the time and obviously the money. And what we focus on heavily was enabling us to build, for instance, we built a composite set that not only was um, the, the Radon ghetto, it also became the, the town of Lyov. Uh, so that was actually one and the same set, just revamped, returned around, repainted, redressed and so on. 
so you know it was and definitely the kirk's apartment which is a, a, at the in episode one and and the, the beginning of episode two is a very high uh, end set because they were a, a, a an eminent wealthy um uh family uh in the um in the fabric industry uh that set became the radon ghetto uh their ghetto set by moving walls and painting and changing a window changing doors and so on so we did a lot of that we built a lot of composite sets that you went through a door and it became another place you went you changed a window you revolved a, a wall and it became something else so that was a was a was a, a exciting way of of uh, you know, uh, digging deep into 230 sets. <laughs> How did your research play out, Jane? Did, did, you, did you scour the web for photographs and descriptions, James? Oh, well, of course. I mean, the war and obviously the, 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 the Holocaust is heavily documented on, on the internet. Yes, I mean, I'm surrounded. I'm still pretty old school. I've got a lot of, I'm surrounded by my uh, library books here. I'm in working, I'm in my studio at the moment in, uh, in uh, the UK. Uh, but yes, yeah, so I go to my favorite, uh, you know, books still, of course, but absolutely the internet is, is, uh, deeply useful. Uh, but I think, you know, a lot of it is guttural too. I think, you know, we, you take a script like this and it, it speaks volumes, you know, and again, but harking back to the team and the people behind it, we're all there to support telling this story and telling the story of these extraordinary characters. I mean, I always believe you start with character, you end with character. And what my job is, is simply to support those characters, uh, providing those um, rich or dank or dark or, you know, whatever backgrounds that are required that are appropriate to the scene and the storytelling. Did you use any past film projects as inspiration? Mm, um, <laughs> if the answer um, is no, that's okay. You know, I can't, I can't think of Eddie directly, but of course you're always pulling from something. I mean, again, the current project I'm doing at the moment, I'm likewise, I'm going to be doing a backlog set and, you know, obviously thinking about how can we use this for 1970 and for 2024, you know, it's, it's a similar vein runs through all of us because we all have to work within a, you know, a tight, uh, 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 financial and time circumstances. <clears throat> Absolutely. Uh, we're going to wrap things there. We Were the Lucky Ones is available to stream in its entirety on Hulu. James Merrifield, good luck to you this Emmy season and uh, thanks for joining us at Gold Derby. Thank you, Ray. Uh, welcome to our special Gold Derby Meet the Experts TV Production Design Roundtable. Uh, I'm News and Features Editor Ray Richmond, and we're here today with Trevor Smith from FX's Fargo, Alex DiGirlando from FX's A Murder at the End of the World, Helen Jarvis from FX's Shogun, uh, and James Merrifield from Hulu's We Were the Lucky Ones. Thank you all for joining us and welcome. Uh, to start off, uh, the timeframes for when your four projects are set are somewhat all over the map ranging from centuries ago to World War II to 2019 to mostly the present day. I wondered if designing projects set in a different time presents a greater series of challenges than stories that are more contemporary, or if it just kind of depends. Uh, let's start with you, Trevor. Well, I think every period show, and every show has a period, um, brings its own distinct challenges and inspiration for all of us, I might argue. Um, immediately you put your, your pin in the chronology map and you start to think about where we are. And in, in the case of Fargo, you know, we weren't that too far in the past. So I had the luxury of essentially working in working spaces and locations for the most part. But it's funny how the smallest little thing can turn on you. So for instance, a, a small anecdote on, on the show that I completed was we're set in 2019 and one of the key characters is a car dealer and he's in a Kia dealership and they went through a major rebrand in 2020 at the beginning of the pandemic. So it's a small thing, but on the page, it doesn't read like much until you spend the next six months in legal trying to get something sorted out and gathering enough cars that have the old branding and signage and so forth. So it's amazing how sometimes you can't even see it coming no matter what your period is, how challenging something might appear. So, um, Alex, what about you? Well, <clears throat> Period, um, 
this show is not really period. Um, there's a, some time, there is a timeline that's 2017, but the bulk of it is present day, although, you know, it's like slightly hints at futuristic. Um, the nice thing about doing a period show is that you don't have to deal with the internet, which can be like a real energy suck. And of course the show is like largely about the internet. I mean, we try to sidestep a little bit by kind of anticipating what surfing the internet will look like in the not too distant future, which is using an, an AI assistant to do it for you. Um, and we made a conscious decision to not fill our sets with screens, um, which is sort of the, the, the go-to thing with when you think of the internet, but as we're sort of in, entering a world of wearable computing and AI, that seems to maybe be falling away. And weirdly, when we were making the show, AI wasn't available for, um, for the masses yet. And it was like in our last weeks that Dolly was released into the world. And it really like kind of threw us for a loop because suddenly the thing that we were making that, that was sort of like, uh, slightly in the future was very much quickly becoming in the past. So, um, I don't know, period, you know, period is accelerating. It's, it's very volatile right now. I, would I thought of that while watching this, Alex, exactly that. Oh my God, have fe the future is now. <laughs> and how does that affect everything? Um, yeah. I mean, the, the shows, I, I haven't watched the show recently, but it, maybe it's pretty dated. But I don't think I no, no it, actually to some degree, it's actually incredibly timely. Um, because of everything that's happening with AI now. Um, Helen, uh, you were tasked with recreating the 17th century in Japan. Uh, is that a lot more complex than 21st century? Uh, I, I thought it was I thought it was quite liberating at first because I, I didn't really have anything to fall back on, as it were. I didn't have any sense of what it was going to be, what the architecture was like. So it was really was starting from scratch. And uh, that soon turned into a lot of discussion, you know, from all the different sources, uh, the um, resources that we had, you know, the, uh, the experts. And uh, a lot of the castles and structures that you see in present day Japan, uh, yes, there are buildings that are hundreds of years old, but a lot of the castles have been burnt down and rebuilt and, I always felt there was room for some level of interpretation. You know, we were reliant heavily on paintings and scrolls because the biggest the biggest pitfall, I think, at first was if you go on the internet or if you look in books and you, you're looking at photographs, those photographs are from the 19th century. You know, so you can't really, you start going down a, a rabbit holes. You think, okay, right, well, let's have some nice paper lanterns and people will be walking around with parasol. No. None of that's right. And so it was very, so what seemed liberating at first started to kind of close in on me. Like getting it right was essential for the show. And I, I do hope, and I hope I get forgiven for the things that aren't right, because inevitably there will be. And uh, that was a fairly constant dialogue that we had collectively but with our producers and with our uh, sort of cultural advisors. Everybody really wanted to get it right. And, uh, I struggle sometimes because I just wanted to kind of break free from that and come up with things that were more cinematic. And so there was a lot of sort of dealing, if you will, you know, trying to trying to sort of win, win over people to say, look, this is more cinematic. That might be absolutely correct, but this is more cinematic. So yeah, I think it was it was fascinating doing something I had no experience in prior to, to, to this. Well, I'll just put your mind at ease, uh, Helen, and tell you that I haven't heard anyone say, boy, Shogun sure was great, except for the incorrect production design. Um, I've heard none of that. Uh, James, what's your take uh, on period versus contemporary? Well, I, I always feel, I mean, with period, actually, I treat them in the same way, really. Um, I think, you know, you start with the, with the references, you start with the research, you go to your, as I said earlier, you go to your library of books, or you scour the internet or something. But I think there comes a time when you just have to go back to the script and you look at you, you dig deep into those characters and then you throw away all of all the reference, you throw away all the textbooks, you throw it and you just then respect, you respect, respond and respect what is written on the page. And then, you know, it, I think it just flows. And I think obviously that comes with a deal of 
confidence and and um, um, self assurance in 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 your knowledge of the period uh, for, uh, as a starting point. But I think it, it becomes very much, you know, uh, about what is what is the, the 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 scene about, and I think you can be forgiven so easily for a nineteenth century chair in a twenty in a in a sixteenth century set, because if you've got the right, you know, if you've got the right nuance, the right shape, the right silhouette, it's fine, it works. So I would say throw it all away and then just. Um, uh, you know, but let it come from the gut and, uh, and the heart. <clears throat> uh, let's go to uh, another question, uh, all of you. I've heard some production designers say that they don't want their work to be obvious and stand out because it can kind of prove a distraction. You just want things to blend in. Given that, what, what's the best compliment someone can give you about what you do? Helen? Well, it would be exactly that. I think it would be to say that... Uh, it's hard to it's hard to pinpoint the sets, you know. The background in so many of our scenes is mist and rain and people moving in the background, activity, all of that. I just, you know, it's, it's such a composite. It's very hard to to really pinpoint um, the. I mean, I, again, I I think that the design, certain of the sets in Shogun are quite showy just by the very nature of them. They are designed to show off that's what they were built for the tigers for example and uh, so it was it was very exciting doing those sets and then trying to do sets like the fishing village where everything is kind of there's a certain homogenous quality to it which i think you know is hopefully hopefully that's that's the best i can hope for i think is to say that those the, the, the sets don't don't overwhelm they they support alex what's the greatest praise you've ever heard I mean, usually when people ask, like, where is that hotel or like in the case of Beast of the Southern Wild, people thought that the bathtub was a real place, you know, like then, you know, you've done what you set out to do. Um, it, it's also like a little bit. I mean, you want to be like, you don't know what I did to make this thing. But, you know, you you keep that to yourself and you you just say thanks. Um, I would say that's probably the biggest and and also i would say i've i've had a couple of instances where actors have come to me and said how the set really helped them get into character and that's that's a really cool things cuz you know we put you know, i mean all of you guys I'm sure do the same thing we put like insane detail into these sets that the audience is never going to see but we do that for the actors so that they're fully immersed in the environment and and therefore they can play off of it and mm -hmm. um it helps them. So, and I, I've had, you know, many times actors come up to me and thank me for that, which always feels good. Wow. Hearing that from the actors, that has to actually, I would imagine that absolutely is the ultimate. Um, Cause that's oh, yeah, they're seeing it. They're seeing it like way up, you know, to, to everyone else, it's just an image on a screen, but to them, it's a thing that they live with. So this is their home while they're doing this, while they're making the project. Um, how about you, James? What's your, what's a particularly uh, flattering remark about your designs that you've heard? Uh, well, I, I just on the last project, uh, we were the lucky ones. Um, the writer that we had just built the uh, Kirk's uh, apartment set, and it was the first day of principal photography. Uh, and uh, Georgia Hunter, the writer of the novel, was on set, and of course, it's her family's story, uh, so it's very, very, uh, you know. Uh, in her uh, her um, her whole remit and her, her whole person, and uh, she came on set and she walked the set. She walked around the bedrooms, the living room, the dining room, the kitchen, and she was incredibly emotional. She she started to cry, and you know, and she basically she said, "This is bringing back all you know everything that I understand and know about my family is in this home." That you've created that we've not just me my entire t wonderful team created so that was a, a very telling moment and uh, i think you've succeeded when you know that it's right and uh, what um uh was just being discussed discussed then by um alex uh, you know the fact that uh, that the actors feel at home in their environments is a great compliment and while literally the mother of the project um you know uh having an emotional reaction to 
to the space mm. that you're in. Well, the grand, she's can't the granddaughter. Can't possibly get better than that. No, she's the granddaughter to uh, Addy, who is the lead uh, yeah. in the um Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it was quite a quite a moment. So well, very special. Hmm. How how about you, Trevor? Well. Certainly when I think of, you know, compliments and a, a level of satisfaction that we gain as designers, I agree with all the anecdotes beforehand in terms of, you know, relationships with actors, that invisibility, authenticity, quality, uh, whether you've got writers or you're, you're, you're grounding people's imaginations are all super satisfying. But I think my spin might be a cinematographic one wherein the DP, who is our, our biggest ally, when they walk onto a set that maybe they've only seen in a, in a SketchUp model or in some photographs or some updates as we build these things, whether it's an interior or a location build, when they frequently told me that um, the set, the, the positioning, the angle of light, the top topographic considerations made them put cameras in places they never even imagined. And that I imagine myself as a filmmaker more than I am a designer when I'm always making the movie I want in my head as I go anyhow. And I always anticipate where I think the camera's going to be. And I feel so satisfied and vice versa when I get positive feedback from a, a, a DP that we found really interesting and inspiring grand or small places to put the camera that we didn't even see coming. So when a shot becomes better than we imagined, I think that's that's the stuff of magic, so. Absolutely. Uh, finally, we're just going to do a quick final uh, question here for you all. Uh, it seems that production design to me, from my mind, is a particularly cool and creative way to make a living. You get to craft worlds and tell a character's life story, sometimes in a single room. Give me uh, one or two quick lines. What's your favorite part of your job, Trevor? I think the favorite part of my job is the conceptual phase, when we're most inspired and prepped when we're gathered with the other creatives and imagining. It's like kids in a sandbox. And I recently heard a Jack Fisk interview where he said, it's like, I get to revisit myself building forts as a child. And I think that's it for me. I really am a farm kid at heart and I love spending other people's money and, and realizing, uh, realizing ideas. And I, it's the realization part that I actually find the most fruitful for me. It's a great big sandbox. Uh, Helen, what's the greatest thing about being a production designer? um for your first job now that you've done it, now that you've done it after being an art director for so long uh i still always abs absolutely enjoy the um the conceptual work and i love sketching and i love uh the, the sort of the probing into the unknown as it were you know having an idea and then spending an entire weekend drawing something that they realize that's not the right thing now I know what not to do. And so I, I, I like that process a lot, but I have to say, I, I absolutely love getting into the workshop at 10 to seven every morning, having a cup of coffee with the paint department, with the construction and greens, and just going through that process, at least analyzing where we're going every day, all the building blocks. I really absolutely enjoy that part. Um, I think perhaps most of all. <laughs> how, how about you, James? Uh, it's certainly for one collaborate the collaborative element of of a team of of artists and and uh, people coming together uh, to create this to to bring this uh, this uh, script to life. Um, but on a, on another sort of level, I also one of my favourite moments is when we've wrapped on the set, and people always say, "Are you sad to see the set? You know, um, the, the end to a set?" And I'm saying. No, I'm so happy. I can't wait to see it go in a skip because, you know, you then know you've done your job. Hopefully it's 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 in the camera and you move on to the next. So there's something about the the um, the saying goodbye that is also then saying hello to the next. So it's that's exciting. You have to leave leave one house and, and, and move to another one. Yeah, um, exactly. Yes. As it were. Um, Alex, how about you? Well, I, I just love what this work exposes one to. Um, between research and location scouting, like you, you get a script often about a topic that you've never know nothing about, as Helen has been talking about, and then suddenly, in in a matter of months, you become an expert on that thing. Um, yeah. Um, and um, 
you know, and, and often sometimes it's things that you don't, that, that you're, your own personal interests wouldn't have drawn you to, and and you then discover something that you love. Like I, I did this movie, Ocean's Eight, which took place at the Met Gala. I never gave one thought about the Met Gala. Now I know more about it than anyone co could hope to imagine, but it's fascinating actually. So um, I, I love that. And I love the location scouting because you get access to places that, you know, you wouldn't normally get access to. Like this afternoon I was, in the morning, I was scouting a a, a seventeen a 1700s farmhouse in Katona, New York, and then I was uh, later in the day I was at um, Philip Johnson's uh, pool room in the old Four Seasons um, restaurant in the Seagram building, um, and I can just like walk around and like walk into you know they cleared out the ladies' lounge, which is not a place that I would get to go to, but it's got this beautiful silk fabric on the walls and and this custom furniture like. To me, and and it's not just the fancy locations; it's the it's the grimy locations that are so cool too. People open their homes to us, and we get to walk around. And not to say that everyone's home is grimy; that's not what I meant. But you get what I'm saying. Like, you, there's just the full spectrum of the world is suddenly open to you, and you see things that you wouldn't get to see otherwise. So, anyway, that's what I. That's Very well put. And, and that's what I love about my job is I get to find out what production designers do. And I would never have any clue without being able to talk to your you four fine professionals. We're going to weave things there. Uh, once again, our esteemed panelists have been Trevor Smith for Fargo, Alex DiGirlando for A Murder at the End of the World, Helen Jarvis for Shogun, and James Merrifield for We Were the Lucky Ones. Best of luck to the four of you this Emmy season. And thanks for joining us today at Gold Derby. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks so much. Bye-bye. Nice to yeah. meet you. Bye-bye.